You open your mailbox and pull out your mail. You flip through the junk mail, and your finger lands on a letter from Pennsylvania. You don't know anyone from Pennsylvania, but maybe it's the time you visited the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. Nope, it's not the same town. You open the letter and see something you've always dreaded to see, the black hand mark. It's time to pay up or meet death. I didn't see you there. It all started early this morning. From hunting ghosts to Bigfoot, UFOs, cryptids, true crime, paranormal, and more. I've always wanted to see a UFO. Oh, I was I was researching for your entertainment. That's Bigfoot's guess. He basically wrote the book on Modern Cult. We aren't really comedians. What if Buddha did cocaine? The Adams Family on meth. This, this is, is the, the Black, Black Hat, Hat Report. Report. See you on the other side. Welcome to the Black Cat Report in episode 89. I am Joey, and with me is the magnanimous, agrarious, Giovannius Gill. You you forgot Gregarian. Oh, Gregarian. What, is, what does Gre- Gregarian mean? I don't know. It's a word I made up. But hello, everybody. Perfect. I made up Giovannius, so <laughs> I guess we're on the same page. Ooh. Today, we are continuing our story on the Black Hand Society and Frank Oldfield. Our main source for the three episodes, yes, there will be three parts of this series, is Inspector Oldfield and the Black Hand Society, written by William Oldfield, his grandson, and Victoria Bruce, who is also an amazing author, as well as a few other online sources to get atmosphere and history that will be listed in the show notes. Before we get into this, though, Gil and I want to let you know that the next Beers, Booze, and Boogeyman will be going live on Saturday, April 6th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The show will be on Haunted AI or Haunted Electronics. Think like, think about like that Furby who's like constantly telling you to put baking soda in your smoothie or that, you know, baby monitor who's constantly telling you to put a Furby in your smoothie or that smoothie who keeps telling you things that you should probably stop listening to and everybody around you is concerned about. Think about that. That's basically what we're covering. Or, you know, hey, I'm throwing it out there. I'm going to I'm gonna take a sidestep. I'm going rogue here, Joey. You know, if you mm-hmm. have any crazy-ass predictions about where AI Ooh. is going to take us or where AI is going... I like that. Call in with those thoughts. Let's start having those discussions. I've said it a million times this year already. This is an election season, Mm -hmm. and there's no real active legislation out there with teeth that is going to stop the influence of AI on this election season. Nope. We're all about to be misled real hardcore, and it's going to fuck with everyone. So call in. Let's let's start having a talk. Let's start having a discussion on that. We want all your theories. Please let us know. Also, what is perfect for the election season is there's a movie coming out this year in April called Civil War, and I think it's going to be on Netflix, <laughs> and it looks awesome. So if you get a chance in April when it comes out, you should see it because you're going to get firsthand maybe something that might happen not to the near future. So Yay. This episode is brought to you by Civil War. <laughs> Not the movie, but the action itself. <laughs> yes, the new Civil, the Civil War Two. Civil War. Yes, and not the game Civil War because we're we're trying no. to no no, 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 no we no. do not want to yeah. be associated with all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We are just the action of it or the American one, which kind of got a little bit like Ooh, you know what I'm saying, but like yeah, they got a little hairy. Other Civil Wars. This episode's brought to you by the Canadian Civil War. <laughs> yes, this episode is brought to you by the word Civil War. The two words, Civil War. (laughs) We all want to see people fighting on Mooseback. Yes. With Oskies. Yes, I cannot wait. They set another syrup trap, Captain. (laughs) They got us this time. Well, yeah, please call into that show. We're super excited for it, and we love to keep promoting on our show, as well as I know they promote it on their show, so we can't wait. Well, last week, we left off with the stories of Frank Oldfield being sent out to Columbus, Ohio, to work as a postal inspector and being handed letters from an extortion plot being played out in real time. He was getting ready to start investigating the case of a lifetime, something that he literally lived and breathed for. He went from spoiled rich trust fund baby to an honest true detective with a penchant for donning disguises to infiltrate and investigate crimes. (laughs) Yeah, life is a passion project he's bad at. 
<laughs> yeah, that, everything he was pretty bad at, except for one thing that we'll find out later in the next episode, in part three. Sudoku. Yes, Sudoku. Oh, he's very good at catch, catching people painting houses, though. Well, we also introduced a much better undercover operative who had a badass nickname because of his gorgeous obsidian black hair, Francis Diamo, a young Italian-American who made his mark because he was literally the only Italian-American investigator in the Pinkerton Agency. That's all he did. I mean, but he was really good at it, but he became a legend because he was the only one, so he was the only one to be sent in for this. Well, he was recruited specifically because of it, though the Pinkertons found out he wasn't just an ordinary investigator. He was an amazing, actual master of disguises who could seamlessly blend in and out of society at a whim. Well, Francis Diamo had escaped New Orleans with his life and his cover still intact. Well, it's here we'll leave these two, as we will go ahead and travel a bit back in time to introduce the Black Hand Society and go into its history. We're going to start with the origins of most of the people who ended up running the Black Hand Society. And by God, if we didn't have to mention where they were from, most of the people who ran it were from Sicily. Sicily, or as we joked last episode, it's the Florida of Italy. We might literally get killed for this. <laughs> if anybody wants to know, we had, I made a short, for for promotion of part one put it up on youtube we had one comment which is my fault because i posted it at three in the morning but we had one comment from a gentleman who just said i'm a part of it just like my grandfather was and that's all he fucking said in the comment i did ask if we could potentially do an interview with him and we're waiting for follow-up on that i really hope that he responds and I, and I mean what I said in the comment, too, which is I'm totally willing to do it 100% anonymously. You know, we can do the whole blurred out face, CBS style, like uh -huh. blackout of the individual with like a and then they went down to the cellar. Like, you know, like put the voice chain. We can do whatever the hell they want. Yeah. Totally cool with that. I, I would honestly love to hear the deeper connected story and origins and kind of like lore yeah. around it from somebody who's actually close to it. Yep. Because I guarantee you it's a lot more detailed and a lot more nuanced than anything coming out in the eight books that are about the society. Yeah, yeah. And there's actually a, there's not a whole lot about the society. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about later about why that is and why there's a thing about it. You know, it's, well, I want to go into some history before we get into the other parts of it. First, Italy in itself didn't even become a real unified country until 1861. I know we talked last episode and you were like, what? Mm -hmm. I can't believe it was that soon. Well, yeah, it did. And it was named Damn. the Kingdom of Italy. And that lasted up until 1922 when a man named Benito Mussolini became the Prime Minister of Italy and the de facto authoritarian. Yep. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He took over and it changed completely. I'm a huge fan of how he hangs out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that good. Look up look up look up photos of Benito Mussolini's death. Yeah. I actually probably think it wasn't a uh, very much different to how uh, Saddam Hussein was treated <laughs> at the end. Oh, no, it was. Oh, no. Saddam Hussein also got hung, but... Mix Saddam Hussein and Richard Ramirez. I know, Ooh. ultimate bad guy, right? But then, um, <laughs> so basically, Richard Ramirez's situation keeps escalating to the point where the crowd actually does execute him. Uh. Um, that's what happened to Mussolini when they fucking strung his ass up upside down. Damn, dude, it's so brutal. I need to get. Oh, I need to get a poster of that. Anyways, it's one of my favorite like dictator executions. Uh, I have a short list of them, but it's a good list. Uh, next episode, we'll go into your short list of uh, dictator executions. Have it ready. Well, throughout this time, and especially in the 1860s, most of southern Italy, or rather the Sicilian Peninsula, was not really governed very much by the Kingdom of Italy. It was pretty much left to govern itself. This let it be rife for strife, as I like to say. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Since there was no one governing it, criminals poured into the power vacuum and basically took over the leadership. This was the beginning of what would be the modern-day mafia, right? So church leaders, judges, policemen, and government workers were all paid off so they could run racketeering efforts. Mm -hmm. If you've watched enough TV and seen The Sopranos or really anything mafia-related, 
There are many shows on it. This is where the idea of Omerta was created. I'm going to throw this in here too. All fucking week long since a part one. I have been thinking about the parallels between, you know, organizations like the Black Hand and the Mafia and government and like everything. Yeah, just like kind of like thinking about that on a, on a yep. social level. Um, I'm so glad that you said the word power vacuum because that's what it is. <laughs> just as it's a, um, a representation vacuum in the United States for Italian immigrants. Right. <laughs> Which we'll get into as well, too. <laughs> but the mafia does parallel the same behavior as the kingdom of Italy with the same, you know, paying folks off, putting people in the in positions of uh, of status and the collection of taxes. Right. Like it's the yep. exact oh, yeah. same fucking thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just a grant that the kingdom of Italy makes it legal in a way. These people just go against, they become illegitimate because the laws are specifically done in a way to make it so that only the government can get that style of it, you know? Well, that's, and not to, and I might totally cut this out, might not, I don't know, legitimacy of a government, right? So, like, the credibility of a government is based off of their legitimate use of violence. That is what establishes a government, 100% across the board. It's who has the legitimate monopoly on the use of violence in society. When you have two organizations that both have legitimate use of violence, you have a civil war. Mm -hmm. Word of the day. It's just one side arguing with the other about who's allowed to violently enforce their laws, their policies, their whatever. But what is the difference between Oldfield and his brother going in, literally breaking into some people's houses? Oh, yeah. From the first episode, yeah. Well. No, what what is the difference between them going in and breaking into somebody's house and start auctioning off their shit, fencing their shit, yep. right, to get money to pay back a debt? Not even for them, but for someone else. Yeah, someone else. Yeah, yeah. They didn't even know. So, so where <laughs> where is the difference between that and what the mafia does on businesses? Yeah, that's hundred percent where I and like, I you know, having a problem with a business of somebody doing some shady shit that's fucking with you and your people. So you beat the fucking shit out of them. In this example, the guy's selling shitty, you know, cash <laughs> registers yeah. like it over and over yep. and over again. It's just like there is a perfect parallel here. Yeah. The end. Then you have the only Italian uh, detective, basically. But I'm just saying I've been thinking about this a lot. And I'm just kind of like, yeah. Totally makes sense there would be a mafia. Nobody else was listening to them or could get anything done. Yeah, and I agree. And I think that, you know, they're both paralleling it because, yeah, there's a power vacuum in Sicily and lower Italy. <laughs> no one's there to enforce the rules. And so somebody goes, okay, well, I can enforce the rules and I'm going to make these rules now and we're going to get a coalition together. They become their own, in quotations, government. The only thing the difference is, is they're not, they don't have legal right to do it. They just use violence like you just talked about, you know? Well, what I'm saying is they don't have legal right to do it because the legal right will come in soon <laughs> to do it. You know what I mean? Like the yeah. the kingdom will take the law. The kingdom, which wasn't representative yeah. of people anyways. Yeah, exactly. But in the mafia, in the exact same way a kingdom operates, the mafia operates within families. That's the yep. exact same fucking thing. Yep. Yeah, because <laughs> like... king, you know, kingdom is, is ruled by the families. But- Sorry for the side tangent. I'm just no. Oh, it's been it. building up. No, I love it. Well, when we're talking about like Omerta, the idea of it was created around this time, and that they, you know, families would not talk to anybody. So basically, no one would talk to the police, right? Mm -hmm. Not even if your significant other or parents were murdered right in front of you. Respect. This, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's respect, but I think that that's... Eh. I think shit has to be real bad before people adopt the code like that. I agree. And, well, this was mostly because they were scared that you would be the next person murdered, honestly. And due to this, and seeing that the southern parts of Italy were becoming more lawless by the day, mm -hmm. the king of Italy at the time, Victor Emmanuel II, set down the army to wipe out the criminals. Well, this is going to turn out like you think it happened. I just pictured a standing army in a field on one side with tanks 
and a bunch of mobsters, full suits, like beautiful <laughs> fucking Italian shoes on. And <laughs> on the other side, yeah, it's one side in Model Ts, the other side in small tanks, just like yeah. going at each other. It, that's what I pictured happening. Okay, well, I, that I don't know if that so, happened as much. Well. They, the army basically didn't differentiate anybody who was a criminal and who wasn't. Because when have they? So the soldiers, yeah, the soldiers who were called gendarmes at the time in Italy basically mm-hmm. killed anyone they saw. There was no due process. Jesus Christ. They were just killed. <laughs> so anyone that was suspected of having any affiliation with the mafia or anyone even, not even really committing crimes, was just Put to death. We have to kill these citizens before they kill other citizens. <laughs> yes, exactly. They, it's horrible. The, what I thought of immediately when I thought when I saw this in my mind when I was reading it, as I looked in modern day, I thought of someone just walking across the street and like basically jaywalking, right? And then a cop mm-hmm. just looks at him and pulls out a gun and shoots him in the head. <laughs> and I'm like, that's literally what was happening at this point. I mean, yeah, they would come up and stab him. That's some Oldfield shit. Yeah, yeah. that's fr- what Frank Oldfield probably would do. <laughs> oh, you're, you're jaywalking? And she breaks into the house, kicks it down. Not respect the law in my parts. Yeah, yeah. I'll show you. Then walks up and just takes the money out of their wallet and runs away. <laughs> runs away. This will pay you for your funeral. <laughs> this will pay for my bullet that I shot you with. Well... Like most times, this caused great migrations of people, right? Normal people did not want to live like this. Yeah. So in the 1870s, the great migration of Italians to America started. So this is huge. Mm -hmm. Basically being funneled because they didn't want to be murdered in the street by the government. And they also did not want to be murdered in the street by the mob. Yeah. And since the United States was seen as a burgeoning place where people could live their dreams... This is what it was seen as, right? Joey, is this a parallel with Latin American countries? I don't know. It's usually kind of how it works, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of Sicilians and Italians migrated here during that time. So in the span of 44 years, basically from 1880 to 1924, about 4 million Italians immigrated to the United States. Damn. That's a lot. That's staggering. This is a, a number I found there. It was in between four and five million, which is a lot. So many people smelled the Statue of Liberty's feet. Mm-hmm. And they probably kissed it, too, because they were like, thank God I'm here. And then they found out, oh, I'm back in the ghetto. <laughs> so all the bl- I thought the blue was patina. It's painted on. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. Yeah. Well, most of the immigrants went through the north. Like we all know, they went through Ellis Island and then slowly mm-hmm. spread around the United States, settling in creating businesses, starting out their new lives, just trying to start again, create families, you know? Introducing the cappuccino. Exactly. Nice, A nice mozzarella, some pasta. Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm super hungry. Haven't ate yet, so can't wait. <laughs> well, these were just the normal people, right? Everyday people that wanted to just live life, have families. Mm-hmm. Well, because they started moving out, the criminal class didn't have anybody to prey on, didn't have a lot of people to prey on. They would just be preying on themselves, which as we know, they don't really like to do. The yeah. criminal class started wasn't too far behind them because they were being mm-hmm. chased out of Italy too. The criminals spread out, finding new places to scavenge and people to take advantage of. Leaving their homeland behind, the criminal element flowed into the United States like ants to a picnic. Mm. Well... It's here we'll introduce you to some of the main villains of the story. But first, I would like to say I just put on my mafia hat, my nice fedora that my parents gave me. has a nice little red feather over here as well. Like, literally, my parents gave me this hat for Christmas, and I um, found one reason to use it. I'm getting strong clockwork orange vibes right now. No, that's worse. (laughs) Needs to fit better. Anyways, I have long hair, so it kind of doesn't work. Now you just look like you're going to start, like, doing ska at any moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. Happening? I don't know. I don't think a fedora fits me well when my hair's long, so if it was a little shorter, it'd look a little different. Where did Joey go? Joey? This is, the ta- this is Italian Joey. Sicilian Joey. This is my ancestors. <laughs> Where did Joey go? <laughs> my, my ancestors were from Naples, so I think my great-grandmother 
grandmother were actually living in Naples at the time. So Florida. The, yes, the Florida of Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Naples, Florida. I'm surprised we didn't live in Florida for a while. My grandparents had a place in Florida, so in they had a place in Naples, Florida. Hmm. That's it. They didn't move too far. <laughs> Well, the one thing I want to say about the Black Hand Society, me and Gil talked about mm-hmm. this beforehand, is that it really wasn't a real thing, right? Yep. So the Black Hand Society was used in papers to sensationalize the criminals. The Black Hand was actually the style of extortion yeah. that was created in as early as 1750 by the Camorra crime family. And it also originated in the area of... Naples, Italy. Uh, mm. Uh, mm. Everybody's obsessed with the 33rd parallel. I'm obsessed with places named Naples. Yes. And my family is, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but this is this is the equivalent of saying the blackmail society, right? Where it's just like blackmail is a tactic, right? Like mm-hmm. Blackmail is literally a tactic with an N. There's like kind of a process behind it. It's it's pretty loose, you know, but it's also a very specific thing. It's like, I got dirt on you. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to reveal the dirt if you don't fucking do whatever the fuck I want you to do. Insert X, Y, Z. And then you get extorted for funds, status, whatever the hell it happens to be that the person who's, who's blackmailing you does. Yeah. It's the same with the black hand society where it's just, yep. it's a tactic. Right. Yep. But the newspaper started calling it <laughs> the Black Hand Society. And then every time you see it, too, I sent you old newspaper clippings, too, of it. Yep. Every time you see it, it says Black Hand in quotes, and then society's just outside of the quotes. Yep. Every fucking yep. time. And it's yeah, like, they made they made it up. Yeah. Grammatically, when you look at it, though, it's like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, it's like a it's like this pizza place I saw in Colorado. Uh, that mm. basically said fresh baked in quotes, <laughs> fresh baked <laughs> pizza. And I was like, why is, is, why is that in quotes? It'd be so concerning if it was just anywhere you move quotes in a statement, it, yeah. it can make something. What if it was the quotes were just around pizza? <laughs> now you're really concerned. Yeah. Now I'm going, what even is this? Or if it was around the word fresh, then you're just like, I'm questioning the age of that pizza or baked. Or baked. Now, yeah. Well, how are they cooking? Yeah, <laughs> anywhere you move quotes can make something sus. I'm just saying. Yeah. Exactly. It's I have no idea. Well, the criminals, you know, at this time, they just basically let it happen mm. and eventually used it to help their efforts as it let them have a more fearful approach to people. Mm. And also, it eventually made detectives not even go into investigating them because, well, it looked like they were literally everywhere. Mm. There was a Black Hand Society member on each street corner or in the clergy or in the government, which for the type of fear the criminals wanted, this worked like gangbusters. Well, they did have connections, but the connections were more in like little families or mafias. Not everyone was connected to each other. And I think if you've seen enough TV shows and stuff like that, you know that they're all not friends. <laughs> For the most part, they're all not, con- they're connected maybe knowing each other, but they're all not friends. They fight over war, they fight over turf, much like the cartels nowadays in Mexico, which literally, and the cartel is a mafia. That's the idea behind yeah. it. They're just mafias. So it's just the word choices we use in the different languages for it. So, well, it's here we'll introduce our first ringleader or godfather of the Black Hand Society. And I'm putting quotations every time I say Black Hand Society. So you can't see it, but I like to do it. But just on the word hand, which is weird. <laughs> Black Hand Society. <laughs> <laughs> That's moving it. Yeah. They're like, what is it? So is it a foot? I don't know. Well, his name was Salvatore Arrigo. He was the oldest and was noted as being very, very well written. Salvatore Arrigo immigrated to the United States in the 1880s with an already long history of crime in Italy, right? He was from the mountains near Palermo, Italy, which is the capital of the Sicily area. And he knew how to grease the wheels of the system. He started his criminal career with fruit stands. Seems well and nice enough, right? I mean... Until you get home and realize all those lemons are kiwis. Ooh, yeah. God damn it, he did it again. <laughs> he did it again. Well, I like the picture. The old farmer just sitting on the side of the road with nice strawberries, blueberries, watermelons, bananas, and such. <laughs> well, if you think that, obviously <laughs> you're wrong. Oh? We wouldn't be going into them if 
if they, he was just literally selling, you know, strawberries, I bananas, do. and such. You've got me hanging on the idea of a criminal fruit stand. I'm ready for this. Well, he used these fruit stands as fronts for counterfeiting money. How the fuck did he fit the printer down there? Uh, well, here's the thing. Oh, wait, he didn't print them at the fruit stands. No. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Well, I mean... Oh. Oh, it depends. It depends on if you know how big the fruit stand is. Depends on the fruit uh, and the fruit. Yeah, if it's bananas, you're not. That's not happening. But maybe if it's like watermelons, I never trusted the Chiquita lady. She always seemed a little sus. And she yeah, fit she all that does. fruit on her head. It wasn't even in a bowl or anything. It was just kind of attached. And her neck's not even that strong, man. No, she has like a very like thin neck, and she's smiling. What's she smiling about? Who would be happy doing? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Sus. Sus. Well, his biggest counterfeiting thing mm -hmm. was selling the fruit, mm -hmm. and then as change, he'd give the counterfeit money to them. So this is how nice. he was very much like, uh, he was laundering the money, I guess, at this point. Yeah. And oh, he wasn't very good at it. Fruit stand and laundromat. He, I think we found the best idea in the world. Trademark. Well, he was found out by treasury agents in Washington, D.C. in 1884. <laughs> <laughs> and he ended up getting sentenced to two years. Two years for counterfeiting, and he eventually was released. Damn. Not too long, actually. For for counterfeiting money. Yeah. Counterfeiters don't seem to get in a lot of trouble back in the day. Well, you can be caught very easily counterfeiting. I think that was the weirdest thing. And I mean, literally, they sent in, you know, Francis and the our Italian American Pinkerton agent mm -hmm. in t as a counterfeiter, remember? Mm -hmm. the, and he got like as being caught, so it was a huge thing at this time, and it was huge for a lot of people to do, and a lot of people got caught doing it. Well, after Arrigo got pretty much let out of jail, he figured counterfeiting was very risky. Mm. I mean, it's really risky stealing money from the government because the government is always going to get their money. Truth, yeah, the IRS always going to get their money. Right, so beat the shit out of you, put you in jail, take all of your things. But anyways, let's talk about the mafia. Let's auction it off. Auction let's, it off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we're just going through two different sides of the same coin. Yep. <laughs> Yo. Well, after that, he decided, I'm going to move to Cincinnati <laughs> because- There's no laws there. <laughs> yeah, there's no laws in Ohio. Sin is in the name. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, I didn't even realize that. I like that. <laughs> it said, they love it so much, they said it twice. Sin, sin, Natty. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh my God. <laughs> well, in Cincinnati, <laughs> here we go. Now I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> I actually like Cincinnati. It's a kind of cool town when I was there. There's the Sin City, but then there's the Sin Sin City. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe that hasn't been called Sin Sin City. No, no, no. That's in t shirt. T-shirt. Trademark. Boop. Merch. <laughs> yep. Well, it was here that Arrigo would have his best idea yet. Mm. He started ADT. What? Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Well, I guess you could say. Holy shit. <laughs> the fucking the alarm system? <laughs> well, I guess you could say he started some sort of home defense system, right? Was it, was so it actually ADT? No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Fuck. I thought, dude, oh my God, that would have been so great if it was literally. Wouldn't that be genius, though? I mean, like, ADT is kind of like out now with like fucking, uh, what is it, like ring cameras and shit being so prevalent. Like, now that Bezos can just like steal all of our fucking info. Yeah. But like, man, ADT used to be everywhere. How many folks grew up knowing half the folks that they knew who had ADT signs in the yard? Didn't actually have ADT. <laughs> like, oh, that was the. I always thought that was so funny when I saw people that like that. I don't know anybody that did. I don't either, actually. <laughs> to be fair, like I did have. Okay, I did have an ADT agent when I first moved in come into my house and like Whoa. be like, "Hey, uh, try to give me like a spiel." <laughs> Couldn't have broke in if you had security. <laughs> That's why. You should the greatest ADT agents broke into my house and then at night and told me I wouldn't have got in if you had ADT. You're just like, no, hold on, honey. I think there's, I think, I think the cat's underneath the bed. Oh my God, there's somebody under the bed. Like, Hi, I'm here to talk to you about not meeting your Lord and Savior by <laughs> buying ADT yeah. home security. I wouldn't have been able to be in here for 16 months waiting for your house to get built if you had. Exactly. And also, 
you can meet your maker, but only in your own time. Hey, who are we to get between you and meeting your lord? ADT, that's who. That's who. <laughs> God, I feel like we just wrote them a commercial. God damn, we're going to bring them back. Well, <laughs> ADT, right? So he started the idea of ADT, a home defense system, but the illegal version. <laughs> he would charge businesses and people to protect them from being killed, knifed, or legs broken. <laughs> I just pictured a lemon with an itchy trigger finger next to a shotgun. Yes. Yeah, that's that's what it was. He just he was he was basically stopping any kind of shakedown. And I know we have gone through this many times in our true crime series because like two or three episodes back, Jing Ye Sal and her pirate empire literally did the same thing. It's a tale as old as time, right? Mm-hmm. So like every criminal empire in I mean, technically, even even legitimate ones do even legitimate businesses do this. Eighty two. Well, Joey, that's why you you pay taxes to fund your local police department mm-hmm. because if you don't pay the taxes, you're going to meet your local police department. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm just saying. And they're going to want their money, just like we said. <laughs> and they're yeah. going to want their money. Yep. Well, throughout the 1880s and 1890s, Arrigo built up his empire, basically connecting with other like-minded individuals who also came from Sicily, looking to bring their criminal ways across the Atlantic. You like money? I like money. We're best friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Super easy. So Arrigo formed coalitions with the Vicario brothers, mm-hmm. who ran a racket in Bellefontaine, Ohio, which, as you may remember from the end of last episode, where the murdered bodies were found. Mm-hmm. You and it connect. Well, he also connected with the fruit vendor, Papino Galba, in Meadville, Ohio, as well. And another one, Aurezio Ronfola, who was a stogie maker in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So he made cigars. Yeah. And Severio Ventola, who was also a counterfeiter from Cincinnati, so the town he was in. His one biggest coalition, though, was with a man named Antonio Lima. Lima was a customs agent in Sicily before he immigrated to the United States. Lima basically was thrown in prison escaped jail, and hopped on a boat bound for the New World. So he jumped in a boat and was gone right as soon as he escaped jail. God damn. Yeah, he was ready to go. And I mean, all of, most of these people who came over at that point after the main immigration basically were criminals because they were trying to escape from the law, escape from being killed. There were a lot, I mean, four million people is a lot of people. Well, this coalition proved to be very lucrative. It also allowed them to maneuver around the police and keep a lot of things secret, as they kept the idea of Omerta, as did everyone else around them. Now, in the last episode, we talked about the blatant, express racism the Italian people were facing coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. The police did not want to help them and really only wanted to throw them in jail, as we saw with Francis Diamo. Mm -hmm. Italian Americans distrusted the police for the right reasons. And the police distrusted the Italian Americans, right? I mean, it hasn't really changed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you're coming over here in a situation where, like, you have an oppressive authoritarian police force, Mm -hmm. the military police, like, coming in, you know, which is causing you to flee the country. Yep. And you get over here, and they're treating you the same way. They're just not killing you, your community, in the same numbers. Yeah, just less. (laughs) <laughs> um, so it's like, it technically is like the lesser of two evils, not ideal. Um, would you want to talk to them? No. No, because you're like, fuck, these people are just like back in the country, but they're just not fucking shooting us as much. Like, whatever, I'll just fucking da da da. That, yeah. and I guarantee you, in a racist institution, they didn't bother learning Italian. You are damn right. They did not know Italian. They didn't bother learning, trying to fucking talk to people. Yeah. And they sure as fuck didn't care about their culture. Yep. So like wh- at the the authorities, the um the people that were supposed to be representing them literally could give a f- didn't represent them. Yeah, they could give a fuck less about understanding them. Yep. So even if you're not involved in any criminal shit or whatever or doing crimes, you still don't want to talk to them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like because they're like there's a nine and a half out of ten chance they fucking hate my guts before I open my mouth. Yep. Right? Yep. And there's a 10 out of 10 chance when I open my mouth, 
they won't know what the fuck I'm saying. <laughs> what? You hit the nail on the head right there. Because, yeah, none of the police spoke Italian. Don't talk to the cops, but also, literally, you can't. <laughs> yeah, you can't. So, sorry. Like, no. And there was very few that wanted to actually get into it. Like, there's very few that wanted to get into the culture, get to know it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those people were in the Pinkerton Agency. Mm. Because, you know why? Because of the Raven sister, who was super fucking hot, and they were all like, I need to learn Italian. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen her make pasta? Yeah. If there's anything to motivate somebody to learn a new language, it's wanting to boink every time. Oh, for sure. Well, that, and also, I just did the money sign because they saw money signs. Yeah. Because there were so many coming over, they knew that they could start looking into these crimes for these people because some of them were starting to get a little more money in their pockets. Mm. They were becoming a middle class, so to speak, because they were the ones working up. And their sisters were super hot. Oh, yeah. they were, And they were ready to marry. Yeah. Like that. Well, them not speaking Italian. Mm. This was used to great effect by Arrigo, Lima, and the other members of the coalition, right? So Arrigo opened his own fruit shop in Cincinnati and dubbed this new society as the Society of the Banana. Yeah. This was not a public-facing name, though, right? Mm. So this was only thing that they used for internal communication and dialogue. Still, the outside, they were looked on as the quotations... Black Hand Society. It's maybe the only time I know of in history where the internal name is like way the fuck lamer than the external name. Yes, yeah, right? Like the Society of the Banana. It's like, I run the CIA. Internally, we call it the super cute fluffy bunny that you just kind of want to eat, but you can't because you love it so much, but you're just squeezing it, but you can't squeeze it too hard. Society. Yeah, but everybody else knows it as the CIA, just like the global spooks. But it's really the super fuzzy bunny society that you just want to eat, but you can't eat, but you want to squeeze, but you can't squeeze society. It's just like that. You know, I would uh, I would say this is, is pretty much like the pet name that you have for your girlfriend, boyfriend, or significant other or anything like that. I would feel like, because most of the time you don't really say those things out. You're kind of like together. You don't really want to say that in front of your friends because, you know, you got the like, you're looking down your hands. Okay, I guess I'll do it. Yeah, it's kinda, I feel like it's kind of like that. Do you think it was an all-male sauna, and that was, like, their code name for it? <laughs> uh, I mean, they probably didn't have any towels on in that sauna. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of those in Ebor. But anyways, true. I mean, hell, just go to the YMCA. You're seeing the Society of the Banana everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, so any extortion note that they would send out would be signed, right, as the Black Hand Society. Mm. And they also started to create certain code words using the theme of the Society of the Banana. <laughs> a carload of lemons <laughs> meant a lot of money. <laughs> a box of lemons meant a smaller amount of money. Which, to be fair, is, to me, kind of confusing because there just could be a bunch of boxes of lemons in a car, and that would be a carload of lemons. They also traffic guns, ammo, and things <laughs> of the like, right? So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, it wasn't noted what code words they would use for them, right? I feel like yeah. they probably use something like a buttload of oranges or a septic tank of dreams, something like that. It was like watching a five-year-old just run towards the edge of the Grand Canyon before they put in railing. Being like, I'm going to jump, I can make it. And she's just fucking. <laughs> I know what you were trying to do, but if I just focus on you, I don't know what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> like... Yeah, I know. I typed that this morning, actually, because I thought it was hilarious when I was typing it. A septic tank of dreams. Well, one thing they would say to each other in terms of sending out extortion letters was, Mr. Tony is very old. Just consulted a physician and advised him to eat bananas. Well, with those code words, they also created a lot of bylaws or regulations for the Society of Bananas. There are 16 articles, and I really don't want to read them all because it's basically the same as what we all know the rules of the normal mafia to be. Buy bananas. (laughs) Yeah, buy bananas. Don't screw over another mafia member, or you'll get stabbed. Don't steal from other members, or you'll get stabbed. Don't go into someone else's territory without telling them, or you'll get stabbed. Yada, yada, yada. And basically, the first rule of Fight Club, right? Do not talk about Fight Club, or you'll get stabbed. Well, one bylaw I really want to quote is a funny one, and is the last article, Article 16, in the Society of the Banana Bylaws. 
there can be no excuse for failures or penalties in conformity with these articles. However, there may be extenuating circumstances in case drunkenness. So they've pretty much made an excuse. If you got drunk, they're like, ah, we'll let them be. If you were fucking hammered on wine, <laughs> there's like, that's, eh, you can probably forgive them. I feel like maybe a great, great, great relative of mine was the one in charge of writing this stuff. Right. Yeah, Gil, yeah, Gil, you're organized. Yeah, you're meticulous. Yeah, you're, you drink a lot. But yeah, you're organized. You can write it down. And it's just like, all right, everybody, did we decide <laughs> on the 15 laws? We decided on the 15 laws. You got that, Gilio, senior, senior, senior? It's like, yeah, I got that. I got that. You guys go on. You guys go on. You know I work late. All right, all right. And they all fucking left. And I'm like, and 16. Maybe it was drunk. Yeah. And I feel like the, the, the person who wrote that article was fucking hammered as they wrote that. And they were just like, well, if I hit nope. on the mob nope. boss's sister, I won't, I'd, if I'm drunk, I, I don't want to be murdered. So. But you were already dating his mom. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Rigo had about 10-ish to 20 years of building the empire. And by 1908, okay. he had a long career in crime. So he was... Getting long in the tooth. Ugh. He was 67 years old. God damn. So, yeah. <laughs> Starting to have a trouble keeping up and wasn't as ingenuitive as he used to be. He's thinking about retirement. He's yeah. getting ready to retire. Yeah. Instead of worrying about money and the next extortion plan, he was drinking wine, mm -hmm. having fun with women. Fuck yeah. And eating lots and lots and lots and lots of pasta. <laughs> How old was he? 67. God damn. All right. You know what? This guy... One life. I'm just going to say. He's winning at life. What's really funny is 67 years old is now the retirement age <laughs> in the United States. Yeah. He, he, he created this it. This dude's doing great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Innovator. I don't think he was eating that much angel hair pasta either. Mm. Uh, I, I don't have anything witty to respond with that. Oh, he was murdering people and he was listening to more of the devil on his shoulder and not the angel. But anyways, again, it's just like watching a little kid being like, I can make it and trying to jump from one end of the Grand Canyon to the other. Perfect. I'm um, tip my hat on that one. And needless to say, it was time to put him out the pasture, right? To give the reins over to a younger, more driven person. Just like that joke, trying to put that out the pasture. This cow was put <laughs> into a pasture, oh, a separate pasture, a retirement <laughs> pasture. For for his life. And he just got to eat pasta. He got to go after women and get wasted on wine. He retired, Joey. You can just say he retired. He was very tired. So he doesn't what? need to get retired again. So glad these I'm glad the studio's walls are padded <laughs> because I'm banging my head against it. And that's what that's what the new guy was about to do. The senior members of the Society of the Banana promoted Salvatore Lima. Or Sam mm -hmm. Lima, as you know, he went by in the United States. Mm -hmm. Lima's father was Antonio Lima, and he was a senior leader in the society already. So he was mm. natural just to take over the leadership, right? Nice. Yeah. Lima was born on February 24th in 1878 in Trebia, Italy, which is in Palermo, Sicily. Again, the capital mm -hmm. of Sicily. Perfect place where most of these people spread out. Sam Lima immigrated to Pennsylvania with his father when he was around 14 years old in 1893. And after that, his brother and cousin followed. So whole family affair coming over. Well, we're going to skip ahead just a little bit in his life in, to 1906 because, you know, kind of was doing the same thing that everybody else in his family was doing. They were working for the Black Hand Society. He was coasting. Yeah, he was coasting. Yeah. Yeah. Licking a lot of stamps, you might say. Oh, oh that's true. Well, he moved to Marion, Ohio, and then two years after 1906, 1908, Sam Lima was made leader of the Society of the Banana. The big banana. We're skipping ahead, like as I just said, because things with the criminal father, he was playing catch with people's balls. What do they call? What do they call the leader of the Society of the Banana's house? What? The banana hammock. <laughs> I love that. That's cool. <laughs> I don't think they'll be too kindly you saying that, though. <laughs> Luckily, I don't check my mail. <laughs> you can't get me. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And we're going to find out that's a great idea. <laughs> well, 
he became the banana CEO, which actually they called him the banana <laughs> CEO. So <laughs> that's um, fucking hilarious. <laughs> oh, as I said, became the banana CEO. And throughout his time as an underling, though, in the society, mm -hmm. he was only extorting like 20 to $30 at a time from railroad workers and longshoremen around the area. Well, yeah. Sam had bigger fish to fry. Mm. Making the connection between the mafia in the 1920s and 1930s, mm. Sam decided not to separate his society from the activities of his fruit selling operation, right? So the past leaders of the society and criminal organizations would generally separate the criminal from the mm -hmm. legal activities. They wouldn't put their headquarters in the same place. Oh, yeah. And this was about what he was going to do. This can be best described nowadays of what Sam Lima's going to do is scenes in The Godfather happening in the Italian restaurants and clubs where they would have their mafia meetings. So places that they had their business would be the same place as their illegal stuff, right? Mm, mm. Which they not starting to separate the legal and legitimate businesses was started by Lima. Damn. It's a huge thing too, which that's like crazy big. It's like the worst thing to be a pioneer in actually. Yeah, because I understand why they separated the two because it yeah. seems so much easier to track gangs and the going on in them and people in the organization if you can just sit out the side the place they own and watch and take down license plates of all the people in the gang. Yeah. And this happened. Literally, the CIA and the FBI watched those hangouts of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. All those gangsters yeah. went, I know this is owned by this guy. I know he's a member. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to find out all his underlings. And eventually I'm going to find one person that's going to talk. And that whole gang going to get toppled. Just like some of my jokes. Could you imagine, though, like back in the day when, like, first off, I think I would have been a fantastic detective if I didn't you know have like a strong just abhorrence towards law enforcement and the state mm -hmm. but I think I would have been a fantastic detective especially if it involved sitting in a car listening to music and just chain smoking all day I can fucking do that you do that now I know I was gonna say you do that besides sitting in the car you sit on a chair yeah, on your front porch outside chain smoking yeah. just chain smoking just watching waiting. Well, Lima managed the whole thing from his desk in the back room of his fruit shop. Uh -huh. Unlike the former head of the Society of the Banana, Lima's writing was awful. <laughs> kind of like mine. Almost childish. <laughs> he also, though, had moments of genius in his writing, though. So when he'd write beautiful, elegant prose, we've silently removed emperors kings and princes and have been as fearless of apprehension as if we were the wind sighing in the trees at night. We revel in bloodshed. We smile at tears and pleadings and our field of operation is bound only by the universe. We scoff at the police. We push them aside as we would a child. Dude crushed those lines. <laughs> I honestly, like writing that, that's the poet. Yeah. Yep. Well, Sam Lima was definitely vicious and relentless, as you can see from the quote above. He especially loved to use dynamite yeah. if anybody crossed him. This is like hectic. He's he's chaos number one here. Yeah, how much for that? Yeah. A penny? Uh, two two pennies? Uh, here you go. I gotta get to work and just... Oh, peels open the... Oh, it's a stick of dynamite! <laughs> I mean, oh, it's the perfect delivery mechanism. A stick of dynamite in a banana. I went home. I found my wife dead. I don't want to talk about what I found in her. What's crazy, too, is there was a story in the book that I read ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like, literally, somebody was going to be killed, right? So, like, they, they went against them, and, and they were being killed. And the last thing, like, they, they went up to them, and somebody was watching them. And they saw a person with a banana up to the back of this person, <laughs> gave them the banana, and then the person literally died three days later. They did They did the op. They couldn't find out what it was. They do think that it was like arsenic poisoning or something that like transferred, cyanide transferred through the hand or something like that. I don't know, but it was like literally they used, they used the Society of the it Banana was... as like a joke to people, to making it in there. I, I can only imagine how hard they laughed. And he was like, yeah, yeah, hey, hey, hey. Hey Timmy, did you did you give him the banana? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gave I I, I gave him the banana. Oh, and, and he died. <laughs> He's like, yeah. 
And they just like, <laughs> and they just crack up over it, you know? Man assassination. I love it. Yeah, bananas. They were freaking killing people with this. Well, damn. again, like I said, he was big into dynamite. So once uh, this man in 1909 dynamited the home of Augustino Anario. And yes, I'm using dynamited as a verb because that's what he loved to do. <laughs> yeah. This guy, Augustino Anario, refused to make extortion payments like we're talking about earlier, sent him letter after letter. And once that happened, Anario was like, F this. He left Columbus and went back to Sicily, where he again received another black hand letter at his home in Palermo. Damn. So Lima would extensively research his mark, mm -hmm. and he would find out everything about them so that he could easily make sure that once he was on them, there were no surprises. And one thing that pissed him off most was people who wouldn't give him the money because of pride, <laughs> right? <laughs> that normally pisses people off, yeah. 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 Well, it's mostly because of pride, right? Not because they didn't have the money. You know, if they don't have the money, they don't have the money. Well, I mean, like, when, when a huge part of your racket like your major part of your racket is literally the imagination of like not responding to the letter. That's how it operates is like this person needs to receive this and there needs to not be a doubt in their mind that they can ignore yep. this because yep. Lord knows they've already spent long enough just trying to read what the fuck it says. Oh, <laughs> like... yes. <laughs> They're sitting there. I wish... <laughs> I wish I could read what it says. I would gladly pay him the money if I knew how much he wanted. I thought the letter said that you were going to give me $20,000 and a banana. I didn't know you were asking this whole time. God, no, I would have just sent it to you. Why are you upset at me? God, who the fuck is your stenographer? God, I got it right over here. Why is my house blown up? <laughs> well, he hated that. Again, like his handwriting's bad, so he hated their pride. And he had to show them that they- How is- Hold on, hold on. <laughs> the head of a letter writing criminal organization can't write. Yes, he, his, his <laughs> freaking- <laughs> Okay, okay, well, I think I'm- <laughs> It's kind okay? of like when Clayton- <laughs> It's like when Clayton Bigsby in the first Chappelle show episode, like, what? <laughs> oh, yes. Literally, yes. That is what it is. <laughs> you know I was a little drunk when I wrote that. <laughs> we forgive you. Article 16, the best. He was trying to show people that they weren't above him. Yeah. And he would make examples out of people, obviously, just like the mafia later on. Yeah. Well, one person was shot for refusing to pay. And in the funeral home, in front of that person's wife, someone snuck in and poured kerosene into the coffin and set it on fire. Whoa. Lima would stop at nothing to get what he wanted and to keep it a secret, which is one of the big things about him is he lived, like any mafia, any criminal organization, secrets. That's why they cover themselves and surround themselves with family because they believe the idea that nobody in the family is going to go against them, right? Mm -hmm. Well... The one thing that he would not do was separating the legal business and the criminal business, which it was, you know, kind of eventually lead to his downfall. <laughs> Should never mix business with treasure. Great, great quote. Sam didn't even let God stand in his way, right? <laughs> which is crazy. A Baptist minister named Reverend Robbins of the Lincoln Baptist Church led a fiery sermon against all of the Sicilians and their criminal ways. <laughs> and honestly... There may or may not have been a bunch of words that are not okay to say at all nowadays that he let loose. Guaranteed. I'm assuming so this is an Irish reverend? Yes. Yeah, so the Irish reverend was talking about Italian folks. Yep. In the early 1900s. Yep. I don't see anything wrong with that. Cool. Probably went totally fine. <laughs> no, it went very fine. Well, Robbins railed against the Sicilian criminal organizations knowing that they were mm -hmm. there. During one of these sermons, he did side-eye a younger, olive-skinned man looking very angry in the back of the <laughs> church. And he just went, nah, it'll be fine. Lord forgives you. Lord forgives you. Well, a few days later, the reverend received a box. <clears throat> and in the box was a letter that had a drawing of a skull on the cover of it, right? 
So mm -hmm. instead of empty eye sockets in the skull, human eyeballs were drawn in the sockets of the skull. A new Stone Cold Steve Austin shirt came in. Hell yeah. Austin 316. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the note was written, mm -hmm. stop your sermons against our employer or you will suffer. Beware. I hope this will blind you. <laughs> He's just like, the devil? What is he, what is he talking about? <laughs> All I've been doing is railing against the devil. <laughs> well, unluckily, it was not the reverend who opened the box, but a clerk of the church who opened it. <laughs> and I say unluckily because this guy really wasn't doing anything. But a choir boy who was waiting in the reverend's office. <laughs> a young choir boy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hmm, what's this? The clerk opened the box to find a charge that ignited packed flash powder, and it exploded and burned the clerk's face and hands. Damn. So it was literally trying to blind him for doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, an eye for an eye. Mm. Even though he never took an eye from the yeah. Sicilian criminals. I feel like the banana-related assassination would make more sense in this particular no. situation. What if it's hilarious if he opened the box and there was just a <laughs> banana in there? <laughs> and then he's like, why would I, why would they, oh, they're trying to keep me, give me some potassium. I received a letter from your doctor saying that you need to eat more banana. Courteous. That is the best way to do it. And then he opens the banana, boom, a dynamite blows up. <laughs> That's, dude, we just created this. Why weren't they thinking of this stuff? <laughs> they were busy selling fruit. I don't know. <laughs> if you're a part of the Black Hand Society and need some ideas for great ways to assassinate somebody. Subscribe. That's what we're trying to tell you. You should subscribe to our subscribe. show. Subscribe. We will help follow you. Follow us. Um, we'll follow you too, you know. Um, we don't read the mail. Yeah. So, sorry. Um, but, but yeah, just, just subscribe and we'll, yeah. just, it'll just keep coming our mailbox we definitely want you blowing up our gmail now hold on one second my mailbox like two months ago I live on on a large curve yeah right like my road's like on a pretty pretty hard turn and my house is like right at the edge of that turn anyways i was sitting outside smoking a cigarette as one tends to mm -hmm. and i just watched this motherfucker <laughs> four in the afternoon drive straight on the curve take out my whole fucking mailbox rip it off of the pole Flies in my neighbor's yard. Whatever. So I let the landlord know, yada, yada. Shit never got fixed. Today I'm outside smoking a cigarette, as one does. Yep. And, and. <laughs> Watching. <laughs> the, the mail delivery person comes up and they go to put the letters in the mailbox. <laughs> they pull down the little door and the whole fucking mailbox falls off the boat. <laughs> he just looked and looked and looked around and drove away. So he just said, we don't want you blowing up our mailbox. I'm like, ha <laughs> ha, motherfucker, you can't do that, it. That already I've already happens. done that. Yeah, I already, somebody already did that for me. Oh my God, they knew we were going to do this podcast. <laughs> I'm impervious. And you know what? I can't send you the money because when it got hit by a car, the little red flag broke off. So like, <laughs> I can't bro, send it back. Yeah. I'm beyond extortion. <laughs> yeah, you're beyond extortion. We'll find out later that that's not true. Mm. Well, Sam Lima was smart. He wouldn't dress in fancy clothing, nor would he try to be intimidating because he didn't need to be. And he really was an intimidating looking person. He had people for that. Mm. Sam wore baggy trousers held up by suspenders over a wrinkly work shirt. So he's just trying to look like a normal Italian-American worker, yeah. middle class, just doing what he could. I guess you could say he was the brains behind the operation because he was. That's why he became the godfather, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so at this time that we want to talk about the extortions and the scheming that they did, right? Mm -hmm. So his best racket was sending, like we had talked about the whole time, was sending letters to pay money or the recipient would be hurt. We talked about that earlier. Mm -hmm. I want to go into like a normal racket so we can kind of go through because there are some like little details that they changed and kind of pioneered, right? So in the book, they went into a shakedown that Sam Lima actually led. They would research businesses and families from other towns. They would never go after a mark in their own town as people would recognize them and thus make it easier for people to ID him if it ever came to that. Well, after they pinned the victim, they would send a letter first requiring money or something bad would happen to the recipient like we had talked about. 
instead of putting their own address on it and for the return part, they would put another state address on it, which was usually a Pennsylvania address for some reason. I mean, I guess they put the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon as the address. There's just like one Amish person that's just like, who keeps sending me this money? <laughs> oh my God, yes. <laughs> How do you think they got the name Steelers? Anyways, oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm, I love that. Uh, I mean, obviously, they didn't want to be tracked back to them easily, so they would not put their own address on them. Like, most likely, we would probably do if we were running a criminal organization. Because some people have talent at running criminal organizations, Ooh. and some people don't. That's true. We do not have the talent for running criminal organizations. That's true. We run a semi-legitimate business. <laughs> semi-legitimate. Don't involve me with your legitimacy. <laughs> well, if nothing was done because of this letter, no money was sent or no letter sent back, another letter was sent with just a teeny bit more ramp up in the violent language, right? Mm. It wasn't long after that that an in-person visit would coincide. That's why I said they uh, you wouldn't be safe if your mailbox was taken I out. I heard somebody here ordered bananas. <laughs> ah! <laughs> ah! Not the banana, I do man. Wonder- yeah, I want to know. So while we're speaking of ramp ups, I was thinking about this earlier. So you know, like Godfather, classic fucking scene. Lifts up the the mm-hmm. um the bed sheets, horse's head. In this situation, yep. you lift up the bed sheets, fruit basket. Everybody starts screaming. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Not the Jaquitas. Uh, how does she hold them on her head? <laughs> yeah. They just get really confused and scared too, because you know. If you got a fruit basket and it was meant with malicious intent, like if I got a fruit basket <laughs> and it was malicious intent, I'd be like, I don't get this. They paired it with wine. <laughs> like, yeah, they paired it with wine. What is going on? First, they offered me $20,000, then want to <laughs> send me a banana. Now they're giving me fruit baskets. This feels like an unhealthy relationship. Yeah. I just wish I could read these goddamn letters. <laughs> I don't know who the fuck to send a thank you letter to. <laughs> Oh, it says here, Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. <laughs> Who lives there? I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> this country's wild. Yeah. There's two of them? Well, if it was a newer town, right? <laughs> they would visit the recipient of the letter and try to intimidate them. So again, like saying, like, you're not protected if you if your mailbox is knocked down. <laughs> All these letters were sent to Italian Americans because, well, the police didn't really protect them at this time, right? So they were kind of, yep. they were doing it. And it's not too long that they would start sending them to other people afterwards because obviously mm. getting a little greedy. Save 15% on your next extortion by giving yeah, us the name yeah. and address of a close friend or relative, preferably one you don't like. Recommend <laughs> us. Recommend <laughs> us. Use promo code fuck you. <laughs> I feel like these people are also like the people who are trying to call you selling you the <laughs> warranty ex- needs to be extended on your car insurance. On your car? Yes. Same exact people. I tell you, it's the same racket. Well, after that, Lima and his associates, I would like to say, Lima and associates, almost like a law firm, <laughs> a banana firm. That is literally a law firm. In Ohio. <laughs> banana and associates? No, Lima and associates. Oh. Lima and associates is literally <laughs> a law firm in Northwest Ohio. Oh my God, it's probably this <laughs> family. It's probably this family. <laughs> It's, it's the shitty ass law firm that always has like uh, commercials on like the local news station while you're waiting oh, to those? see if your school had a two hour delay or not. <laughs> <laughs> like there's like four people that are going to laugh listening to that. Well, after they would visit in person, right? They wouldn't just leave town. So if it's a new town, they're not just going to leave after they do their visit to the first person. Lima would have a few people stay in the town, just like lingering around and see what the rumors were or the talk would be about the town. Mm. He wanted to see if anybody knew about what happened or if the word spread quickly. Damn. Yeah, he's doing a little nice reconnaissance. He's smart. I mean, really, they would also just like get new marks too because as they're walking around town, they're just kind of like looking around and be like, that's a business. That's a business. They look like they've got money. There's a lot of bananas in that fruit seller's, <laughs> that vendor's thing. That person literally said they're scared as shit of getting a letter like that. So I followed him home and got their address. <laughs> yeah, what? exactly. Yeah. And so it was easy for them to like get new towns, get new people. And like Damn. people would know that 
they'd know friends. And so like the mm. first person would get a shakedown, right? Yeah. And then they'd be sitting at home. They probably wouldn't tell anyone because they don't really want to, you know, say like, oh, I got extorted. Because it was kind of looked on as bad. If you get extorted and paid it, like, hey, like that person, why would you pay them the money, right? Well, you're like, you're bringing them a weird financial plague to their city. It happened. And so mm-hmm. they would start being like, hey, now after it started spreading to a few people, somebody, one of them would be like, okay, like, hey, I have you got a letter? They talk about you know, mm-hmm. like ease in there. Have you got a letter from this person? They'd be like, yeah, I got a letter. And then, and then they start talking and everybody would start talking, even though they couldn't read the letter, they would still <laughs> start talking. I don't know what it said, but they're forming, they're forming small clubs at the uh-huh. library. All of them just sitting there with to fucking... figure out what it said. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an R. No, that's an L you idiot. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> that was probably true, actually. They probably had to fig- use coders to figure out what happened. What is? What do I want? What do they want? All of our houses are getting blown up, and we have no idea why. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, as bad as he was a writer, he was very smart creating the shakedown mm-hmm. racket, right? So in the two years, two years that Limo is running the Society of the Banana, they had their most prosperous years. You know, when you can't do, teach. And that's what he Exactly. Was yeah, that's literally what he's doing. So they were sending loads of money orders and, in quotations, harmless looking checks to their businesses, associates in the States and overseas to their families in Sicily. Mm. So basically they were just like, hey, let's spread this out. They're laundering the money that they're getting, basically, so that the postmasters and, you know, the inspectors and the UPS wouldn't start, you know, looking into them too deeply. That's why they, in quotations, and again, I did it, innocent looking checks, you know. So, yeah, it's normal for folks that are coming here from like other countries that are especially like first generation yep. immigrants to send stuff home. Well, during Lima's time in power, he went after a lot of smaller businesses, right? Because it's easier to get them to give them money. Mm. They're not necessarily going to go to the police at that moment. These Italians just keep coming to us and screaming about bananas. What the fuck is wrong <laughs> with that? <laughs> yeah. And I keep giving them bananas, and they keep getting angrier. (laughs) They just keep talking about stamps and bananas and letters. (laughs) I don't fucking understand (laughs) these people. (laughs) So we just went back, and we started putting bananas on the stamps. Case closed, Captain. Case closed. Done. Thank you. Thank you. We did it. Good job. Pat on the back. (laughs) Well, Limo is getting board just like when he was extorting the 20 30 dollars from the middle italian americans and he just mm-hmm. he was tired he wanted to go after some bigger fish right he was ready for it he was hyped mm-hmm. enter john amicon and his millionaire fruit business giant this guy's got a big business right mm-hmm. it wasn't just the money that Lima was after john amicon like the reverend publicly berated the black hand society and called them Lazy cowards, losers hey. too ignorant and pathetic to work, and they were leeching mm-hmm. off of hardworking men. Well, pissed off Lima, damn and fierce, and John Amicon was set dead in his sights. Mm. Well, Lima did what he did best, and he started off with the first little more passive letter, right? Trying to extort money out of John Amicon, and then on his second letter, he got a little more violent, like normal, which, mm-hmm. to be fair, it wasn't just the normal $2,000 for the most part like they send in most every letter in the last episode, right? Mm-hmm. For Amicon, it was $10,000. Damn. Which in today's money is 324649473.68. So basically 325000 That's almost enough to buy a single bedroom house in Asheville. <laughs> yeah, yeah, close. I mean, I think we're a little more now. <laughs> Well, unlike the normal Italian Americans, John Amicon said, "Fuck this! Mm. I ain't going to bend the knee to this gangster." Mm-hmm. He stood up, straightened his tie, mm-hmm. rolled up his cuffs, mm-hmm. got his cane, okay, put on his fighting cloak and a monocle, and walked over to his local U.S. post office and dropped <laughs> the letters on the desk of Frank Oldfield. God damn! And that's where we're in part two of the Black Hand Society and Frank Oldfield. <laughs> Fucking nice. Next week, we're going to get into the takedown of the Black Hand Society, or as we know, the Society of the Banana. Fucking nice. Fate could have not picked a better person who <laughs> loves to get involved in other people's shit and thinks that they're greater than they are. Yep. Frank Oldfield is just dumb enough and just connected enough 
and just motivated enough to daydream and scheme obliviously to go after an international criminal syndicate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's... <laughs> Somebody who's not aware of their own faults needs to be in charge of spearheading that because anybody who is is self-aware enough to have, I don't know, value in life. And this yes. motherfucker is just like, I can do that. I can do that Sunday. Hmm. <laughs> For sure. I'll punch him. <laughs> Here, sir. Hold my banana. No, no, no. You hold my gun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they just keep trading back and forth, too, would be the point. Well, we want to send out some shout outs, actually, for the la- for this episode. So we want to thank uh, my coworker, Morgan, Morgan, for listening and all the topic ideas. Mm-hmm. And also Dante and MJ. They are giving us all these great ideas. So thank you, guys. Eventually, we're going to do 12 Tribes. I know we said we might not do that one, but we are you know, eventually. Is this a thing that changed? It's a thing that changed. Is this what we're going to do? Joey's dropping surprises on me all night. It's a thing that changed. I'm dropping a surprise because one of my coworkers almost got abducted into 12 tribes. Just told me recently. I fucking told you two years ago when I found the goddamn FBI documents about 12 tribes and I looked them up and I found out that they were in a proximity that is fairly close to where this show is recorded. Yep. Fuck yes. Gilly got some shout outs over there, bud? None at all. No. Um. Uh, nope. I ain't got shit. Nope. No, oh, perfect. Uh, well. Other than the fact that uh, saw folks that had just started subscribing to us in the past few days, right? Like, I always check up. The, I always I wake up, make my coffee, I sit outside, smoke a cigarette, watch my mailbox get knocked over, and, you know, I check the <laughs> numbers. I check, I check the points for the day, and I'm like, oh, I'm like, I, I saw a handful of folks coming in from uh from Instagram recently and um shout out to y'all. Welcome welcome to this thank weird you. little family we got going here. Yeah. Thank you guys. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank y'all. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week with the finale of the Black Hand and Frank Oldfield. And if you don't hear from us, check our mailbox. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>I don't either, actually. To be fair, like, I did have, okay, I did have an ADT agent when I first moved in come into my house and, like, be like, hey, uh, try to give me, like, a spiel. (laughs) Couldn't have broke in if you had security. (laughs) That's why you (laughs) The greatest ADT agents broke into my house and then (laughs) at night and told me I wouldn't have got in if you had ADT. You're just like, no, hold on, honey, I think there's. I think I think the cat's underneath the bed. Oh my God! There's somebody under the bed. Like, Hi, I'm here to talk to you about not meeting your Lord and Savior by <laughs> buying AT yeah. Home Security. I wouldn't have been able to be in here for 16 months waiting for your house to get built if you had. Exactly. And also, you can meet your maker, but only in your own time. Hey, who are we to get between you and meeting your Lord? ADT. That's who. That's who. God. I feel like we just wrote them a commercial.